everyone. Um, I'm Tiga. I'm an artist and environmental engineer. And I call what I do eccentric engineering. So I do experiments with data and technologies and computers that ask questions of how we design and engineer the systems within which we live. I'm particularly concerned with how to design from the dystopian position of the Anthropocene. How to um, make creative work that is simultaneously critical and generative. We're scrambling to figure out what it means to have moved an enormous amount of carbon from the ground into the atmosphere, largely via combustion. And so this talk considers some of my work dealing with environmental data and a changing climate, and hopefully points to some of what is at stake as we collectively face this. What does it mean to have augmented the atmosphere and the ocean, uh, the atmosphere and ocean's capacity to absorb heat, and to be rapidly increasing the entropy of Earth's systems? The term entropy, of course, has two definitions, one in thermodynamics and one in information theory. So to start with the, th the thermodynamic definition, entropy is the randomness of the constituents in a system. In other words, if you heat or increase the temperature of a gas, it increases its entropy, its randomness. And so what ways can we see this in our shared environmental systems? So first of all, we can look at um, the biological interfaces that surround us and how they change through time. So this is the study of phenology. Phenology is the timing of reoccurring biological events such as flowering and migratory patterns um, in different ecosystems. And it's of great interest of researchers because it's showing how the biosphere is changing um, with climate change. Observing phenology is to observe a complex rhythmic and cyclical relationship between temperature and time. The oldest written biological data set on record is the cherry blossom bloom in Kyoto, Japan. This is of interest because it um, heralds the beginning of the cherry blossom festival and has been pieced together since 1800 AD looking um, from the records of emperors and aristocrats um, in Japanese history. So this has become an important climate record because the, the cherry blossom um, bloom starts with after a series of warm days at the beginning of spring. And so it's very clear from looking at this record that the bloom is becoming um, sooner and happening sooner and sooner in the year as our Earth system is warming up. So looking at some of these phenology data sets is at the heart of this project, which was a collaborative project I did at the Environmental Health Clinic at NYU called the Phenology Clock. This is visualisation software that um, visualises phenology data from different ecosystems. And it produces 12-month clocks. So January is at the midday, uh, the um, 12 o'clock mark. And each band of colour shows a flowering pattern from a particular species of plant. So it shows the duration of that flowering event. And what is revealed is temporal relationships within ecosystems. So you can see Sydney on the left, flowers all year round. New York on the right, like nothing happens for six months of the year, right? <laughs> I'm, as an Australian, I'm horrified by this. Um, so I've used this software to look at a number of phenology data sets from different places. And here is a clock generated from a family of eucalypt trees. And what's amazing about this image is you'll notice that there's always five or six species of, in flower at any one time. Why would this be? Why would a family of um, trees distribute themselves temporarily throughout the year? The reason being is it's thought that they're, that they're co-evolved with this species, the flying fox. The flying fox is the dating service for the trees, it pollinates them, and the trees provide a food source. So by temporarily distributing um, flowering patterns, this guy has a food source throughout the year. Plants mediate the atmosphere Increasing entropy flows on to destabilise mutualistic relationships such as these. Increasing overall temperature increases un un the unpredictability um, of these species synchronicities. A project following this, also exploring phenology, was a project I did scraping the Flickr database, looking to see if I could see these patterns in messy crowdsourced data. The resultant images are made up of thousands of images that are tagged with particular species name and laid out according to timestamp. So January on the left, December on the right, and each band is a year. 
And here we can see a very clear um, southern hemisphere flowering pattern. This is a jacaranda, which is an Australian flower. Um, but these images are largely made up of things that look like this, right? A Texan family goes into the field to be photographed with the blue bonnets because you're not allowed to pick them. So these images actually became, uh, what stood out for me was they were about how we actually relate to these different species, how we see them and how we use a database such as Flickr. They're as much a result of like our social relationships with species as they are indexes of a changing um, environment. Environmental observation has, of course, become increasingly computational, and we no longer rely on direct observation of the biosphere to understand climate. Instead, we use a network of satellites, weather stations, data centres, and so forth to do this. We process unthinkable amounts of data, and our computational systems burn up millions of dollars of electricity every month to do this, producing enormous amounts of heat. The transfer of information cannot take place without a certain expenditure of energy, which is what Norbert Wiener said, the father of cybernetics. Processing data is never thermodynamically neutral. Any act of organising pushes against a tendency for everything to degrade, and cooling has always set the limits on computational design. Computation is about managing heat. It determines how densely components can be packed and where data centres are to be built. If you put them in the Arctic, it really reduces your energy costs. In other words, cyberspace is hot. Computing is an exothermic reaction. Of course, despite uh, the overdue push to increase the use of renewables, data centres and computers are still uh, run on coal and use Coltran. And they use um, somewhere between 1% to 3% of our electrical output, and this is rising. Every video, image, Google search we make has an environmental effect. Every computational automation, every machine learning innovation relies on combustion somewhere. Shouldn't these costs be considered in how we assess the success or failures of our computational systems? And how might we rethink our network interfaces to make the material, these material costs more tangible? These questions are posed by a series of experimental Wi-Fi routers, eccentric Wi-Fi routers that I made in a series called um, Radio Tropisms. This one called Open Flame is a router that is paired with a candle. To bring up the wireless network, you have to light the candle. You, when you blow it out, your network disappears. Wax um, is laid down over time, depending on your online life. Each Wi-Fi router also offers a network. Um, another one in the series, an orbit oscillates its signal strength with the orbit of the, of the moon. So for one day a month, you get really strong, great internet, and for one day a month, you get none. And it changes over a 28-day period. Again, how might we invite our environmental systems into our networks? Finally, this is a Wi-Fi router controlled by a house plant, and the plant is equipped with a camera. It can take photos of itself and replace images in your network feed. So any unencrypted data <laughs> ends up with a photo of this plant. <laughs> so these are provocations. How can design of our network interface emphasise our ecology rather than hide it behind seamless user interfaces? So to conclude, I want to return to this term entropy, but I want to consider it from the point of view of information theory. In information theory, entropy is a measure of the loss of information content in a signal or a system. A term developed by um, the father of information theory, Claude Shannon, to, de to describe the probabilistic measure of uncertainty in a system. All right, so break it down. What does this mean? Uh, it's, uh, I, it's ambiguous. If we think about the entropy of a coin, uh, we can get either a head or a tail when we toss it, right? This is known as one Shannon of entropy. If the coin was to have two heads on both sides, the entropy of the system is zero because it's completely predictable what the outcome would be. If the coin was to have three or four or more faces, the amount of information contained in the system is um, greater, and so the entropy of the system is greater because it's harder to predict. The ultimate information science is meteorology, and the project of weather prediction is an ongoing attempt to lower the entropy of our weather system in an informational sense. We use data to build models to hopefully better predict the um, behaviour of our system. And as historians like Paul Edwards have shown, climate prediction is intimately tied with the develop of planetary computation. 
Computer resources are always inefficient in meteorology and it is the ultimate big data science. And to me, there's a sort of dark irony that we've built sophisticated global systems for collecting earth and climate observations to predict climate at the very time where our collective impacts on human society are actively destabilizing it. One consequence of this could be observed earlier this year at Oroville Dam in California, when the catchment received more than twice its annual rainfall last winter. As the emergency spillway was engaged for the first time in the 49 year um, life of the dam, it began to erode, the engineers became concerned and 200,000 people were evacuated from the watershed with less than an hour's notice. Although the incident is indeed a failure in adequate engineering and maintenance of that spillway, to call it solely an engineering problem overlooks it also as being a climate problem. So a water engineer's job is to size stuff. The height of a dam, the size of a culvert, the depth of a drain, these things are sized to present, prevent flooding at certain storm intervals. Um, you generally think about how big your catchment is upstream of the thing you're designing. You think about what sort of rain patterns are going to happen in that catchment and how frequently it's okay for it to flood. The best practice guidelines in stormwater modelling used to be to model 10 rainfall patterns um, for each thing you're designing. And just this year, this was upgraded to 20. So this is like doubling the amount of human labour and computational work that's going into modelling for these sorts of water infrastructures. So what's critical here is that at best, we only have about 150 years of rainfall data, much less in some regions. And this has been taken from a stable, predictable climate. At the heart of this sort of engineering is an assumption that past rain is a good indication of future rainfall or future weather. What happened at Oroville is outside of, historical, outside of what the historical data would have indicated could have happened. They got a lot more rain because their models said that this would fall as snow rather than rain in the catchment. And so calling Oroville an engineering failure is actually not accurate because it's also a failure in our ability to predict climate. So the work of a water engineer has become increasingly difficult as precipitation data drawn from a stable climate is becoming less and less indicative of things to come. And the stakes are high. If you look around, you'll notice that all of our infrastructures, our dams, our culverts, but also our media and computational technologies are specifically calibrated to stable conditions of the past 12,000 years. And climate change promises to decouple us and these systems from our, their climactic niches. Even with the rapid advance of computation, climate destabilising is increasing the entropy of our system and reducing our capacity to predict it. And with all of our technologies, we need to be considering their increasing energy demands and their climate affordances. Thank you.